Good evening and welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Megan Gage Finn. I serve here as Senior Associate Pastor and it is good to be together this evening. A warm welcome again and as folks continue to come in, we will continue to expand in the space and gather as community this evening to celebrate the continuation of the Westminster Town Hall Forum which has been a, a, a service to this community since 1980. I also would like to invite you to join me and one of my colleagues, Reverend Dr. Matt Skinner, to uh, enjoy a continuing the conversation following the forum. We will gather in the recreation room, which is out and to your right. It's a space where we gather in small groups uh, to discuss what we've heard and what we're thinking about following the forum. You're welcome to grab your breads and spreads, refreshments, and then join us in the recreation room directly across from Westminster Hall. Now I'm excited to introduce to you our musical offering for this evening. We begin with a performance by Ginger Commodore. She is a singer and songwriter who enjoys an illustrious career here in the Twin Cities. She performs jazz, blues, rock, rhythm and blues, and gospel music. She's an original member of the Grammy award-winning group The Sounds of Blackness, as well as the critically acclaimed jazz ensemble More by Four. She's also a teaching artist with several Twin Cities musical arts organizations. Please help me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Ginger Commodore. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Everybody's doing well this evening? Yeah? All right. When I wake up in the morning, love And the sunlight hurts my eyes And then someone or something without warning, love Bears heavy on your mind Then I look at you And the world's all right with me Just one look at you And I know it's gonna be It's gonna be A lovely day A lovely day A lovely day a lovely day And when the day that lies ahead of you Seems impossible to face And someone else instead of me Knows exactly, exactly the way I look at you And the world's all right with me Oh, I just want to look at you And I know it's gonna be It's gonna be A lovely day a lovely day, a lovely day, a lovely day.
Brian Zemniak. When I wake up in the morning light and the sunlight hurts my eyes and someone without warning love And the world's all right with me. Yes, just one look at you. And I know it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lovely day. Do you know this song? A lovely day, a lovely day. I need you to sing along with me, and it just goes like this. It's very simple. Lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, a lovely day, lovely day, a lovely day. You have it? All right, I want to hear you. Let me hear you. You applaud yourselves because you did a fabulous job. We'll applaud you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
of the season Red, green, gold, brown Now and bring some white To chase away the blues And bring me here Could that be it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see trees of green, red roses too. I watch them bloom. Me and you, and I think to myself, What a wonderful world! I, I see skies of blue. Dark sacred nights And I think to myself What a wonderful world The colors of the rainbow So pretty in the sky it's also in the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? What they're really saying is I love you. I hear babies cry. And we'll watch them grow They're gonna learn much more Than we'll ever know And I think to myself What a wonderful
the colors of the rainbow pretty in the sky also in the faces of people passing by i see friends shaking hands saying how do you do what more than we'll ever know and I think to myself what a wonderful Thank you. Thank you, Minnesota. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do we have time to do a couple more? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, you say yes. You say yes. Maybe you can help. I like the way some of you have exactly the right expression in your face and in your body. You're like, when the night has come oh, and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we see. No, I won't. Be afraid, no, I won't be afraid. Not as long, not as long as you stand by me. My darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. I see you giving out. Stand, and it's okay, stand by me. When the sky you look upon Oh, seems to crumble and fall And the mountains crumble into the sea I won't cry, no I won't cry, won't shed a tear Just as long as you Stand by me So darling, darling Won't you stand by me Oh, oh stand by me Stand, stand, stand by me
Jay Young, everyone. Jay Young. Gentlemen, this is my son, Brandon Commodore. When the night is gone and the land is dark and the moon is the only light I see. Thank you so much. Okay, you can be seated now. You know, do we have time? I don't know either. We have, oh, do one more? Yeah. I mean, we can, we can. Must take the A train Do you want to go to Sugar Hill, Harlem? If you, if you miss the A train You miss the quickest way You won't make it up to Harlem Oh, hurry, hurry, get on board, it's coming Because soon you'll be in 
Sugar Hill Harlem. Boy, I don't love I'm a little bit. Boy, 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 I'm a little bit. together for Brian Zimniak, Jay Young, Brandon Commodore. My name is Lola Falana. No, Ginger Commodore is me. Thank you for having us. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you. One more round of applause for Ginger Commodore and her band. Hello again and welcome. My name is Megan Gage Finn. I serve as the senior associate pastor here at Westminster, and it is good to be together this evening. As we transition into the main part of the program, I would like to again welcome you and remind you that we will have a continuing the conversation small group gathering for those who would like to um, further some time of fellowship and conversation around what we hear and learn this evening. We will gather in the recreation room, which is out to your right and directly across from Westminster. Mr. Hall, you're invited to grab your breads and spreads, refreshments, and then join us there for the conversation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the forum's director and interim moderator, Tane Danger. Hi, everybody. Hi, that was very nice. Hi. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. My name is Tane Danger, and for the last, thank you, the, for the last, the, yeah, thank you, for the last three years, I've had the a, a tremendous honor to be the director of the forum, and I am really excited to be tonight stepping in and joining you all in this interim moderator role, and I could not think of a better guest to get to start this uh, role with than the incomparable Nancy Giles, who is our speaker tonight. I am super excited. <clears throat> so I did, I wanted to start tonight by saying I, I've done a lot of moderating and hosting of things in my career, but I'm really excited about this because the Westminster Town Hall Forum is special. And I know this because I've been the director for three years, that it's special. <laughs> for here, but it's honestly, and I, and I have to kind of tell this to folks, like it is special in the entire country for what it is. This mission that this program has of inviting voices of conscience to address the issues of the day from an ethical perspective and bringing eight to 10 national, international level speakers to our community to do that. And having done that consistently every single year since 1980, literally before I was born, is an amazing thing that we have here in Minnesota. And in those 43 years, you know, I mentioned we've had some of the most uh, inspiring, insightful, important speakers in the world here in Minnesota. And again, a piece that makes it really special is that it's free. It's something that is open to the community here for you all, like in person, to come and join us uh, via live stream. Hello, live stream audience. Uh, via the radio, we're broadcast on Minnesota Public Radio and KMOJ. And, fun fact that I feel like enough people don't know about, as a podcast, 
I actually, I personally am the person who edits and puts together the podcast, so it would mean a lot to me if you all subscribe to the Westminster Town Hall Forum podcast. Yeah. It, uh, <clears throat> Just search Westminster Town Hall Forum wherever you get your podcasts. And you can listen to both programs like tonight and some of our recent programs, but programs going back years, you can hear our speakers. So I will say with that, what's really humbling for me to be stepping into this interim moderator role is that the forum is something that this community built. Right? Like, that this is not something that was sort of created by a particular institution. There's never been sort of one big funder or something who stepped in and said, oh, this is what this thing is going to be. It literally was people who were in prior to 1980, like working in downtown Minneapolis and thought that Minnesota deserved to have a national speaker series and came and partnered with Westminster Presbyterian Church to create what now is the Westminster Town Hall Forum. And it has been something that was both invented by and sustained and built by this community ever since then. And it has, <laughs> It, again, that is, that is humbling to me, and I think of what that means, that, you know, this is not something that is sort of owned by, definitely not the director or the moderator, but it is something that is owned by this community, because you all built it. And whether that's you all having come to these programs like you are tonight, or having come over many years, whether it's, you know, folks who volunteer, we have some of our amazing volunteers in the room who make this happen, our advisory board, who helps guide and direct this program, uh, the folks here at Westminster who help us put every single one of these together, the folks who donate and support this program. Like it is takes, it's a cliche, but it really does take a village of people to put together what this thing is. And so as I come into this, I really think about what I'm doing as trying to be a good steward of what you all, frankly, have built and what many people before me have put together to create in this tremendous institution that is the Westminster Town Hall Forum. And I really believe that like with you all, like uh, if we're able to keep building this thing together, that we are gonna keep delivering these amazing, great programs and do this for today and for entire new generations that are going to listen and come and gather and hear these amazing speakers like Nancy Giles that we have tonight. Thankfully, we have very good partners who help us with that, and I'm going to thank a few of them here. Uh, one of our oldest, longest partners, Minnesota Public Radio, uh, who are here recording everything tonight. Um, love. So just so you all know, folks who are watching, uh, Minnesota Public Radio, NPR, is recording tonight's program and our entire fall season. And the entire fall season of the Westminster Town Hall Forum will be broadcast on NPR in December, the week of December 11th. So set your calendar for every day at noon in December, uh, the week of December 11th. December 11th, every day at noon, you'll be able to hear one of our fall season programs. Uh, we're also, I love this, because this is a, a newer partnership, but something that means a lot to me. Uh, tonight's program is also going to be broadcast on KMOJ, the People's Station. Uh, yes, I love that. 89.9 here in the Twin Cities, and so uh, if you are interested, this program, if one of your friends is missing tonight and they want to hear it, it will not be brought, it's not this Sunday, it is the following Sunday, which I realize is both a problem because it conflicts potentially with church and with CBS Sunday mornings, but <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you can listen, it's fine. You can have a dual thing going on. So. Uh, Thank you so much. MinPost has been one of our media sponsors for a long time, a nonprofit community supported newsroom and a trusted guide to critical issues and challenges and opportunities facing Minnesota. You can sign up to receive their coverage at minpost.com slash newsletters. And then Sahan Journal and some of our friends from Sahan Journal are here tonight. I love Sahan. Their mission is to provide reliable, high-quality journalism for immigrants and communities of color in Minnesota. You can find them and their coverage at sahanjournal.com.
So a little preview in the second half of today's program. We're going to open it up for questions with Nancy Giles. As uh, folks who've been to the forum know, you can write your questions on a card. There's cards in your programs. You can also, if you're watching online, submit a question in the chat, and we'll try and collect those. And I will give you a preview, those of you who are here in the sanctuary. We are going to try something a little bit new tonight, which is we're also going to invite folks here, if you want, to come and ask your question yourself. We'll have two microphones down here for you to come and actually ask uh, so that we can see who you are and hear your question directly from you. So I'm just, I'm, I know this is a new thing, so I'm giving people like a whole half hour preparation to get in their head, like asking their question. So with that, it is my extreme honor to introduce tonight's speaker. So Nancy Giles is a comedian, actress, and social commentator. Since 2002, she has been a regular contributor to the Peabody Award-winning program, CBS News Sunday Morning. In that time, she has earned five Emmy Awards for her unique blend of common sense wisdom, laugh out loud humor, commentary, and interviews. She is a veteran of Chicago's esteemed Second City Improv Troupe, she has appeared off-Broadway in Nora and Delia Efron's Love Loss and What I Wore, and won the Theater World Award for the musical satire Mayor. She was one of the stars of the acclaimed series China Beach and the sitcom Delta. Her solo shows include Black Comedy, The Wacky Side of Racism, Notes of a Negro Neurotic, Things My Afro Taught Me, and The Further Adventures of the Accidental Pundit, which the New Yorker called the surprise of this annual festival and a rocking good comedy. For more than 30 years, she has also been a volunteer with the 52nd Street Y Project, helping at-risk youth take part in acting, playwriting, filmmaking, poetry, dance, and art workshops and classes. Please. A big round of applause to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Nancy Giles. Thank you. I'll tell you what's, what's scary sometimes is sitting up there and like listening to the credits and then you hear like, and 30 years ago and 40 years ago and I'm like, sheesh. Oh, I was gonna say something different but I'm in a sanctuary. First, I have to thank not only uh, the Westminster uh, Forum for inviting me here, but I have to, okay, have I got my notes here? Wait a minute. I have to thank, okay, what happened here? What, what is, okay, I have to thank Tate, Tane Danger, and um, hold on, people, just talk amongst yourselves. I wrote it down. Where the hell did I write it? Heck, heck, did I write it down? Anyway, Tane and Karen, who have been spiriting me around all day today and have just been wonderful. This sanctuary is so beautiful, and there's just so many areas to look at and take in, and it's, it's just an honor to be here, and I love, thank you for taking the time to sort of talk about the tradition of this, this program and what you guys are building, because, you know, we're living in kind of uh, challenging times, and building community, and giving each other a chance to breathe and um, listen and try to hear each other. It's just so important. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you all for being here and part of this evening. Um, OK. So I sort of want to start. Oh, there it is. There's where I had all the names. Karen Kramer, Tane Danger. OK. <laughs> Westminster Town Hall Forum. I had the wrong page turned over. All right. So um, I really am looking forward to pretending to be Carol Burnett and taking, turning up the lights. Well, the lights are up and having questions. But I'm going to talk a little bit and just sort of explain the, my angle when it comes to storytelling and finding humor and whatnot. And the first thing I want to say to anybody that has a story to tell or wants to tell stories is sometimes it's the worst situations that give you the best stories. Case in point, why I'm still at Sunday Morning has to do with having a small part in the movie Working Girl years ago. And um, I, I played one of Melanie Griffith's uh, secretarial friends, and a lot of my stuff got cut out, you know, because that's what happens. But anyway, um, in one scene, you see me in this uh, bright blue Angora dress and bright blue window pane stockings. Ladies, remember those from the 80s? Oh my God. Uh, and I had 
uh, bright blue, uh, high-heeled shoes, and my hair was um, relaxed. This is tense. My hair was relaxed and straightened. And uh, I, I came out of the makeup room and saw myself in the reflection, and I thought, you, you look cute, you know? And then this uh, crew guy kind of motioned over to me, and I thought, oh, he's going to ask for my number. OK. And I'd, I had just read that book, um, uh, The Rules. And they have all these, it's what a stupid book. But anyway, I, I, was, I didn't have a boyfriend at the time, and I was willing to you know, be open to things. And they're like, you know, if he's interested in you, he has to pull out a pen or pencil, and he has to write everything, all these rules. So anyway, so I sort of saunter over to him, thinking he's going to ask me on a date. And the guy says, uh, oh, and I forgot, the sauntering part, I'm not so good on high heels because my mom always told me since I've been 6'1", since I was 14, you don't need high heels. So I'm a little unsteady on the high heels. And the guy says, yeah, you're looking good. And I'm like, thanks, he's going to ask me out. And then he goes, we're taking bets. Are you male or female? Oh. Right. Devastating, devastating. And I was like, I sort of blinked and like ran away. And then um, Mike Nichols, who is the wonderful Mike Nichols, who is the director of the movie, I sort of told him about it later in the day through gritted teeth. And he had this very sing-songy voice. And he was like, point him out to me. I'll have him fired immediately. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. But it was devastating, right? OK, so remember that. And thank you for the awes. That it, was, it was bad. OK, years later, uh, through Aaron Moriarty, who is one of my dearest friends at CBS, uh, it's because of Aaron that I'm at Sunday Morning. She's a wonderful Emmy-winning correspondent for the Evening News and Sunday Morning in 48 Hours. Anyway, um, Aaron had seen me in a comedy show. She had this idea of us doing a radio show together. We did that. And she also was very good friends with Rand Morrison, who's the executive producer of Sunday Morning. And Aaron said to me, you know, you should do something. You should do a commentary. And I thought, huh? So. And the, the show loaned me some VHS tapes of commentaries, and they were very, I thought, kind of boring, like Calvin Trillin on language and this. And it was like, I thought, I, I, what? I can't, you know. But I had this idea that had been nogging in my brain for the longest time, and, and I had a chance to pitch it to the Rand, the boss. And my idea was how high-heeled shoes were a conspiracy against women. Mostly because I couldn't walk in them very well. And, and, you know, I was a big fan of Sex in the City, and they never limped. Nobody ever had a bunion or anything like that. That's, B, that's BS. OK, code, 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 right. OK. Um, so I explained it to my boss, who didn't laugh, which if, is devastating. If you're trying to explain why something's funny and people just look at you, it's, you flop sweat. I leave. Thanks so much. Bye. And then two months later, out of the blue, I get this phone call from CBS saying, we have you on the schedule to write about the high-heeled shoes things for this week. It was a Monday. And I was like, OK. And I just started typing like some mad person. And then I realized that I had a big element that could bring everything together. And that was that crew guy who asked if I was male or female. And OK, I'm going to tell this as it happened. And then later on, when questions come up, if anybody is offended, because I don't, you know, it's very, it, it, you can be offensive these days just by, OK, um, no, no more disclaimers. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, so I thought about him. And I thought uh, another reason why I hated high heel shoes was that he confused me. And I, and I wrote, you know, if I was a guy in drag, I'd walk in the heels better. He should have known that. <laughs> OK, good. Thank you for laughing. All right, good. I told that story at a graduation once, and it turned out that a professor was transsexual and complained about how what I said was like offensive and stuff. So I, just, you know, flop sweat. Anyway, okay. So that started Sunday morning, and 21 years, and it was a bad thing. And 21 years later, I'm still there. It started as a one-off, and then they kept me, which was great. And as it turns out, oh, somebody was going to applaud. Go ahead. <laughs> so. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was kind of primed to do opinion pieces. It, a lot of that comes from my mom. Um, she had a take on everything. Um, she would say she would get vibrations about people. And another thing that I love that my mom said, you know the term wedgies. You know what everybody, what happens when those. OK, we, I didn't grow up with that term. My mom called that having a letter in the mailbox. <laughs> take it? I know. I have a letter in the mailbox, ooh, you know. So take it, 
Use it, but give Dorothy Dove Giles credit for that line. All of you. She was unique, my mom. I mean, I loved um, the character of Sally on the old Dick Van Dyke show, and I remember thinking, why does she always wear that black bow? And mom said something like, you know, oh, her husband died in a plane crash, and she never got over it. And I thought, oh, okay. Just accepted what she said. We listened to Tony Bennett, and uh, he, you know, oh, great, great voice. I actually got to meet him. I'm going off topic. But anyway, we'd hear him on the radio, and the song would fade out, and Mom would say something like, um, you know, I always liked Tony Bennett until he got cute and left his wife and got a perm. And I was like, hmm, okay, interesting, Mom. And then years later, when I was like in fourth grade or so, when Diana Ross didn't leave the Supremes, but the name of the group was changed to Diana Ross and the Supremes. Me and my fourth grade friends were like, Diana Ross, who does she think she is? <laughs> she killed Florence. So there you go. The opinion started, right? Um, another thing I'll just say before I go into this story about me and voiceovers, because that's been a big part of my work as well. I'm grateful for it. And when I, the more I thought about what I was going to talk about tonight when it comes to stories and women telling stories, the more I realized in this voiceover story, it kind of encapsulates a lot of stuff. But before I get to that, I just want to say this. I got a chance to write a piece for Sunday morning pretty early on um, about like Black History Month. And because actually the war in Iran started, uh, they bumped the piece from like February to March, which thrilled me because I thought, hey, every month should be Black History Month. And as far as I was concerned, you know, we didn't have to restrict it to that. But the thing about Black History Month, and this is another thing going back to my mom, is when I was growing up, it was called Negro History Week. And my mom used to say when she was growing up, it was called Colored People's Hour. I think she was kidding. <laughs> My mom, yeah, right? Um, but the thing, and then there are all these, and I wrote this piece about that, and then about like this, the concept of being called African American as opposed to black, sort of how that morphed forward. And I was a little confused because I never got like any kind of survey or anything like that. Do you like African American better than black? I liked Afro American, you know, for obvious reasons. I dug that. But African American, to me, didn't make sense because Africa is a continent. You know? And there's all these different countries, distinct countries with distinct languages. Where's that great couple I was talking to who went to Africa? Where, oh yeah, hi, right? You know, all these different, okay. And different tribes and different languages. You guys wouldn't settle for being called European Americans, would you? That's weird, right? My thought was, I thought we should be called by what we truly are, which was kidnapped American. But no one, no one agreed with me. I don't know why. Anyhow, all right. So um, I'm going to sort of talk my way through this story about voiceovers. Oh, you're such a great audience. OK. So I call this story, It's a Voiceover Life, like it's a wonderful life. Only it's not, but you'll see. OK. <clears throat> you're watching Chocolate Obsession Week on Food Network. USA, characters welcome. If you received a wet newspaper, press 1. Yeah, that was me doing voiceovers. And uh, <laughs> so when I started out doing voiceovers, which I've always done along with everything else, I did commercials for sexy, fertile, girlish things. Things like, oh, hair color, tampons, you know, diet food, mascara. So fast forward, and years later, I'm doing spots for postmenopausal osteoporosis, <laughs> women with bladder control problems, underwear liners, depressionisreal.com, things like that. Shaken leg syndrome, which I always like calling shake and bake syndrome. But it's actually restless leg syndrome. It's a real thing. And isn't that the thing that like kids used to get in elementary school, the really smart kids' legs would kind of go, I wanted to cultivate that and make my grades go up. But anyway, okay. Um, so these days I am like a voice for what's called women on the decline, health-wise. <laughs> yeah, wait, here's one of my greatest hits, and I'm proud of it because I actually, I didn't meet her, but I got a chance to work with Sally Field. <clears throat> Don't take Boniva and tell your doctor if you have difficult or painful swallowing, chest pains, or severe continuing heartburn, as these may be signs of serious upper digestive problems. Thank you, that was one of my greatest hits. <laughs> so... <laughs> Once you're doing a lot of those uh, voiceovers and you're speeding your way through bodily functions and side effects, 
you're at the end of your voiceover circle of life, as the Lion King puts it. Anyway, years ago, I was so fortunate, and I got to be hired to be one of the voices to help brand Lifetime Television for Women. So naturally, the meanest person that I ever worked for at Lifetime Television for Women was a woman, right? Okay, for the purposes of this story, let's call her Satan. Okay, that's the only time that word's coming out of my mouth. I promise, okay? I realized as I was walking up here, I thought, I don't know if I should say that, but okay. For the rest of the story, we'll refer to her as S, like that, okay? All right. Um, sometimes sisterhood is not so powerful. What can I tell you? Um, she was late 30-ish with a, a kind of pinched face and dirty blonde hair and that... I just had a baby and I'm still producing milk, so don't fuck with, uh, thick, fuck, mess with me. Sorry, sorry. I forgot. Karen, I forgot. Sorry. Okay, let me do that again. Uh, okay, NPR. Bleep, bleep. Okay. All right. Uh, she had a pinched face, dirty blonde hair, and that I just had a baby and I'm still producing milk, so don't mess with me because I'm in the La Leche League attitude. Okay. All right. So anyway, she constantly had her hands in her hair, touching it and tossing it and doing all those things that many white girls had done with me, done it in my face my entire life. The kind of flip to the left and the flip back and the curling hair behind the ears and the whole bending over and combing it with your butt in the air. It was like, I, I can't explain it, but for me, um, every hair gesture from them felt like a personal screw you to me, you know? I felt like they were messing with me in some primal way almost. Um, now this is all pre-braids and extensions and how people, you know, you can buy hair or weave hair or let your hair grow into dreads and you can, it can move, it can move in the wind and I get it, I get the power of that, but this is all before that. Anyway, in those moments when S was uh, flipping her hair back and forth, it reminded me of why I always loved Judy Garland and Julie Andrews. They were huge stars, talented as all get out, and they were never fussy about their hair. Think about it, Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, right, that little short bob, right, and even in Mary Poppins, it was all kind of up and out of her face, didn't deal with it, she was like, great, all right, and Judy Garland in concert, my God, sometimes she was dressed as a hobo, sitting on the edge of the stage, and she'd run her hands through her hair, and it would just stand up there, and she didn't care, I just, I love that about both of them. Okay, anyway, I digress, so, back at Lifetime, we're uh, doing the recording, it was one hour, nine to 10 every Monday morning, and I was kind of tense because I had to catch a 10.30 train from Penn Station to St. Albans, Queens to take my mom to chemotherapy at the time. I was a little wound up. And S had this habit of dawdling. Sometimes she'd stroll in a little late. I'd stand in the recording booth. I was ready to talk, had the scripts on a music stand, had my coffee light and sweet. And I would watch her through the control room window. And she was like, you know, tossing her hair and eating what looked like runny oatmeal. And she put raisins in it while she ate. It was just, it was just nauseating. Um, and she'd laugh it up with the engineer. And it was like I was watching some little like commercial scenario. I don't know what. And eventually, she'd look in my direction. And after a mic check, and uh, whenever you're ready, I'd start reading her scripts. <clears throat> He was in her bed, and she killed him. Killer in my bed. On Lifetime, television for women. <laughs> Another script. Most women have one husband. She had two. My two husbands. On Lifetime, television for women. <laughs> Another script. A daughter asks if she can sleep with danger. Mother, may I sleep with danger? On Lifetime, television for women. <laughs> that movie, I think, starred Tori Spelling. I don't know why I know that. But anyway, these scripts, she was paid to write this crap. I was, like, stunned. And then she'd give me notes. She's the producer. She's the writer. She has a right to do that. She would say things to me like, Has anyone ever told you that you have a, a tendency to end your sentences up in the air? What could I say? I mean, what can you say when you're dealing with the criminally insane, you know? You, 
you just breathe. That's what I did. I would breathe and I would go, okay, um, I didn't realize that I, and I'll make sure that all my intonations go down at the end of each line. You know, I'd say it very quietly. My heart was pounding, trying to let good energy come in, bad energy go out and breathe. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I found out she wanted to do voiceovers herself. But apparently, no advertisers were interested in somebody whose voice went up in the air. You know, so there you go. Anyway, so months of Mondays, hair tossing, dumb writing, me reading. She'd give me more notes. Have fun with it. Okay. <laughs> Killer in my bed on Lifetime, television for women. Ha <laughs> ha. Can you sound younger? Killer in my bed bed. <laughs> on Lifetime television for when women? Um, this time, can you, uh, you know, uh, give it some sass? Killer in my damn bed. <laughs> on like, you know, I, I, it's like, oh my God. So by now I was having nightmares about these sessions and in the nightmares, you know, she's flipping her hair and there's a giant pair of lifelike scissors chasing her all through her open concept first floor. And uh, my silhouette I'd see in the dream peering through a window and then you'd see like police siren lights going off and whatnot. Anyway, I went back to more Mondays until I lucked out and I booked some spots for Yo Play Yogurt for a Yo Play Breast Cancer Initiative that they were doing. And the tagline was, Yo Play, together we can lick breast cancer. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was the real tagline. It's a little, okay, you know, whatever. Lick, yeah, whoever thought, of... okay, anyway. God, you guys are great. Okay, anyway. Yo Play paid much better than Lifetime. And between me getting heart palpitations and this weird tick I started getting in my eye every Monday at about 8.45 in the morning, I thought to hell with this and I quit. Okay, I didn't exactly quit. Um, <laughs> so as not to burn bridges, I asked my agent to tell Lifetime that I had a new schedule change and, you know, I, it, it, I know it doesn't sound nearly as dramatic as I quit, you know, you so-and-so. I, I just, it, but, you know, I didn't have the courage to go right to S's face, but that was as courageous as it got for me at the time. So that next Monday, my last day, when that final Lifetime session was done, while she was chatting up with the sound guy, I sort of skulked out of the recording booth grabbed the elevator, and as the doors were just about to close, the silver end of an umbrella poked through, and the doors opened again, and it was her. Yeah. So, she and I rode the elevator 14 floors down, slowly, in total silence. And I knew I had to do something. I couldn't just stand there. I had to take a stand for me, for my people. So I hummed. I did. I literally hummed. I hummed. That really happened. We got down to the bottom, uh, to the first floor. She went her way east toward Grand Central Station, and I went west toward my apartment in Hell's Kitchen. And as I walked out and walked down the street, I thought to myself, you, you hummed? You hummed, Nance? That's what you did? You hummed? Oh, gosh. So as I walked, I wasted no time, and I started fantasizing about the ways that I could get back at her in my dreams and make her head explode. And then it came to me. I would seduce her husband. <laughs> okay, note, insert loud guffaws here, I say. Anyone who knows me will get a kick out of that idea. My idea of seducing somebody's husband. Hey, hey, S's husband, uh, are you into classic sitcoms? <laughs> Can you lift heavy furniture? <laughs> are you a licensed contractor? That's my idea of flirting, so anyway. <laughs> So back to the fantasy. Husband is seduced, and then I'd get pregnant on purpose. And then I'd show up 
eight and a half months later, large with child at the front door of their craftsman home in Hastings-on-Hudson in New York. I'd make sure to look as skanky as possible with a do-rag around my head, maybe some pink curlers up all in there, and, and uh, a grill, a silver grill on my teeth. Yeah, all of that, all of that. I'd bang on the door, hey, I'm having your man's baby, right? Open the door! Can you imagine, right? This was my, you know, I'm gonna really get her and she'd be shocked and she'd open the door and she'd be totally bald because she flipped that dirty blonde hair once too often. <laughs> and walking west on 45th Street, the more I thought and reveled in that fantasy, the more I realized that it was a perfect lifetime television for women original movie. And I heard myself doing the promo. A nasty producer, bitter about losing her hair, pushes a brilliant black voiceover actress one step too far. <laughs> Jessica Chastain. Beyonce. <laughs> Shoot. A lifetime television movie. My mulatto baby father. <laughs> Saturday at nine, as part of Lifetime's Women Killing Women Weekend. <laughs> and that is my story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I love about that is it, it's, that there's so many different elements to it, like the workplace stuff and women not supporting women and racial stuff, because my whole life, by black people and white people, I've been told, you don't sound black, you don't act black, where are you really from? I'm from Queens, New York, this is me. Um, so I, I love it because it was really difficult to work with this woman, and she was, she was mean, she was evil. And, and I found out later she fired a lot of other women because she really wanted to do that job herself. Herself, anyway. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I like about it is it just combines so many elements of stuff and that I was able to sort of look back and it took me a while, but to look back at that and kind of laugh at myself and laugh at her and do these extreme characters, it, it was a lot of fun. And in the time I've worked at Sunday Morning, it, it always feels like if there's a way to be funny and it can keep a conversation going as opposed to shutting it down by yelling. I mean, one of the best compliments I get, and I get it pretty regularly, is I like how you think. I don't agree, but I like it, and I'm fine with that. I mean, I'd really like it if they liked how I think and they agreed with me, but so I, again, just to underscore what Tane was saying, what you guys are creating here is so important, especially in this day and age where lines are drawn and it's like, it's no joke, and I am trying on my end like to not post horrible things about people on, I'm not gonna even call it X, but you know, not post, or if I am saying something about someone, make a reference to the behavior, not call the person by name, and I'm just really, I'm grateful that I have a chance to do that on a, on a white scale and on a national platform like Sunday morning, and now, I'm really thrilled because I'm dying to hear your questions. So, time for the questions. So, get to the mics, everybody. Come on, let's go. Come on. How did that time out? Good? Yeah, you're Great. perfect. Okay, good. I, gotta, I gotta do a little spiel. Oh, here. oh. Stand by for Tane's spiel. Oh, now, that's a cue for everyone to go find the bathroom. Uh, so, no, thank you. Big Nancy Giles, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tane Danger. I am director and interim moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Nancy Giles of CBS Sunday Mornings. So we are moving into the Q&A portion of the program. I mentioned this at the top, but we are going to invite people uh, who want to come to the microphones here if you want. You can still write your questions in the cards. Uh, so both of those options are on the table. If you're watching via the live stream, hello again, live stream audience, you can put your questions in the chat and we will try and collect them that way. So I am gonna do, a, I'm gonna take a quick moment here while people are thinking about their questions. I, I talked about this a little at the top, but the town hall forum <clears throat> is a special program in that it is something that is 
completely built and supported by this community. Uh, and um, I know this again because I wear both hats as director and now as interim moderator. And you all in supporting the forum as individuals are what powers and makes every single one of these programs happen. Uh, we are going into our year-end fundraising period uh, and I'm coming tonight to sort of share where we're at with this. We have a goal between now and the end of the year of raising $60,000 to fund us, which really matters as we start to think about like our programs for next year. I can see people like looking at me like, oh, that's a lot of money. I've, uh, I've only got 59,000 in my pocket. Like, how am I going? <laughs> By the way, if you have 59,000, that would help a lot. Um, but I, here's the really good news, and I haven't said this publicly before, this is very exciting. So we have a match for our year-end fundraising uh, this year. So a combination of our advisory board and a gift from Mortensen Companies has put on the table 30,000 of that $60,000 for our year-end gift, which is very good, very cool. And we are tremendously grateful. That means they have put that on there asking and hoping that we all, as the community that loves and cares about these programs, will step up and do that other half of this before the end of the year. So, I am asking you to think about what this program means to you, what the Westminster Town Hall Forum means for you, and I'll just be honest, like, not just you. Think about like how valuable it is to have these programs in our community, to have them you know, broadcast on the radio and via live stream and as a podcast, that there's something that people can come to and hear amazing speakers for free in Minneapolis all year round. And think about what that means to you and what it is worth, and think about how you can help support this before the end of the year. And last piece I'll say on this is, honest to goodness, like every single gift and donation really matters and helps a lot. Uh, there's ways you can give. There's a donation envelope in your program if you're here. There's also you can scan the program and give on your phone if you want to use a credit card. Same if you're watching online, you can go to westminsterforum.org slash donate. Uh, and <clears throat> help us build this program and help us sustain it for this year and for, as I said earlier in the program, for many years to come. So thank you all so much. It really does matter a lot, you all helping. Okay. Thank you. So, all right. So. Uh, if you are doing your questions right now and you are writing them in your cards, uh, please do that and we're going to have ushers come around in a minute. So the last thing that I'm going to do is, I said, we're going to invite people who want to ask their questions into the microphones to come down, but this is the first time that we've ever really done it this way at the Town Hall Forum. So we wanted to give you a chance to practice. And so if you want to turn to the person next to you, and ask them a question that you actually would like to ask of our guest, Nancy Giles. You'll have a chance to rehearse for just a moment and potentially make a friend. All right, uh, we'll give you about 30 seconds. So on your mark, get set, go. All right, oh, I'm going to okay. turn this. You get to go here now. now okay. Right. Tane, may I just say, Tane Danger. Yeah. What oh, a I... great name. You, should, the, the, you should have a radio show, Tane well, Danger. Let's talk. Uh, right. oh, I do know. This is a radio I know, show. I know it is. And you yeah. should subscribe to the podcast. You should subscribe to the podcast. I have a podcast, too, called The Giles Files. And I always forget to tell people, please subscribe. But everybody has a podcast. But... Right. Ours are the best. We're breaking convention. I'm supposed to say, now, Miss Giles, if oh. you're ready, I will present the questions from the audience. All right, then, Tane. I am ready. All I'm right. Prepared. It does look like we've already got somebody right up here. So if I can just ask you if you'll say your name and where you're from and then uh, ask your question. Okay. My name is Marilyn, and I'm from Golden Valley, and you need a tall girl mic. This is a oh. little short. <laughs> you're doing here, great. We're, get, we're making a... I know. There right. I know. Okay. But you have a nice, good voice. Uh, what's your name again? Marilyn. Marilyn. You've got a strong voice, so it Thank works. You. Okay, my question is, what has given you the most joy in your career? Hmm. Oh my gosh, that's... Well, hmm, boy. 
I'll say this, there's a particular story I did for Sunday morning where uh, I got to go to Haiti, and uh, Mitch Album, the writer, he has, uh, he was affiliated with an orphanage there that was in very bad shape, and not only did he and some friends from Detroit come and rehabilitate this orphanage, but over, and, and this was after the huge earthquake in Haiti, Mitch went out there, Mitch and his wife went out there at least once a month for a solid week for like 10 years. This was not just somebody putting in FaceTime and leaving. Anyway, we ended up doing a story about the orphanage and the kids, and I went with my dear friend and producer, Mary Lou Teal, and I fell in love with the, the kids and what Mitch and his wife were doing, and I've been back twice since then, and it, we were, you know, before I had a chance to, sum up, to talk to some of you, and it's so important to get out of the United States and see how other people live. A couple of us were saying that. It's just, it, it expands your mind. You get to appreciate things. You get to sort of just see things. And the, the country has a lot of difficulties, but the people's spirit was just magnificent. And I think about those kids every day, and there's a lot of great stories and people that I've met, but that one just really touches me. And the name of the orphanage, by the way, is Have Faith Haiti. You should check it out online. He, fund, he got funds and they built a whole new orphanage with a pool and stuff, and these kids end up going to college, and he and his wife Janine are just fabulous people, and if not for Sunday morning, I wouldn't have known. So there's that. Yeah. That's beautiful. We've got someone sitting or standing right here. This is my close personal friend, Liz yes. Conway from Oberlin College. Liz! Hi, Nancy. Hi! <laughs> um, uh, now from Uptown. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. And um, my question for you is when you think about storytellers, and especially storytellers whose stories uh, illuminate hard issues going on right now, who are some of the folks you particularly appreciate? Oh, my. That's... That's hard for me to name because sometimes I, it's just, I'll listen to like the Moth Radio Hour and hear total strangers whose stories like rock my world, which is one of the things I really love because everybody's got a story. And um, I guess, let's see, I guess I could say like Lily Tomlin had a way of sort of winding um, great characters with really funny and poignant stories. Um, oh gosh. Uh, yeah, okay, Liz, thanks. I'm gonna have to think, all right, you, okay. you messed with me there. I'm gonna have to think about some more, but, um, but yeah, um, and I'm learning about more storytellers, and that's one of the things I really like, actually, about podcasts and the different ways that some of that stuff can be laid out. But um, when I see you later, you can give me some names of people so that next time I can answer that question more intelligently. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, so we have a question uh, from the audience somebody submitted on a card. So in your opinion, mm -hmm. what is the power and importance of storytelling in our current social climate? <gasps> it's huge. I think if we are able to share our stories and, and be personal. Somehow, if, I think I heard this once or read it, God is in the specifics. So the, and the more specific we get with where we're at and what our stories are, the more universal they are. It, it, it almost seems counterintuitive, but everyone's been fired from a job, everyone's had like heartache, everyone may think differently from their parents or have a different experience with someone that you've never met or accidentally offended somebody. Or, so I, I just really believe in the idea of just talking personally without yelling, but just talking. And, and the other side of talking is listening. And that's really important. And that seems to be something that a lot of us are, are, are sort of short-tempered about. And, one of the things that I found in doing different talks in different parts of the country, even very red states or areas where, you know, whatever, is that most people just want to be heard. If you let people say what's in their mind and in their heart, I mean, you know, I would say, unless they're a serial killer, you're going to find something that you have in common with them. It just takes patience and it takes time. And... I don't know if it's because of social media or what, the, whether the immediacy of things happening means that people don't want to take the time or they feel like it's taking too long, but I think that's what I really like about stories is it's not like punchlines. They, they kind of 
wind in a way, and there might be some funny parts, and there might be some serious parts, and my gosh, if you can make people laugh when all that's going on, one of my favorite, oh, okay, here's a good storyteller, but he's a comedian, and he's my friend, Louis Black. Louis has fab, thank you, give it up for Lou. He, he not only has punchlines, but he's, he's got a reservoir of great material and interesting ways of looking at things. And I, I could listen to him forever, but that's, okay, that popped into my mind, Liz. Ha, huh? see, okay. see? Yes, if you don't mind saying your name and where you're from. Oh, yes, hi. Sure, I'm Bill Devini, and I'm from Minneapolis. And my question is, when did you first realize that you were funny, and when did you first realize you could make a living at it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, uh, okay, well, I'll have to talk to you later about, some, about the second part. Um, gosh, that's a really good question. I guess I, I remember distinctly senior year of high school, because I had this, I felt like I could do funny things, but it was kind of a little bit locked inside me. I was kind of shy, and I would sort of observe like the theater crowd, which I was never part of. I was in the orchestra, so I played in the pit orchestra of these different musicals, and I'd be sawing away at my viola, looking resentfully at the leads, you know. And um, we had this thing at Jamaica High in Queens called Senior Show, and it was like the last week of classes before graduation. And we wrote it ourselves in a sort of a parody of the different teachers and different in-jokes, you know, like someone would say, um, you know, study hall, huge laugh, <laughs> you know, why, who knows? So strangely at Jamaica High when I was there, there was only one black teacher, Mrs. Montgomery, and I thought I'm gonna write a piece about her and she was very, um, very strict and had this way of talking that was almost like Barbara Jordan. And there were these weird requirements in, in her class, like you couldn't just raise your hand and say, can I go to the bathroom? She had you write out a bathroom request letter and you had to keep it and submit it saying something, it said something, I have a copy of it somewhere. It said something like, um, dear Mrs. Montgomery, normally I take care of my needs before I come to class. Today, however, it, I have an emergency signed. Da -da. You had to submit that. It was no joke. So I wrote this little sketch where she sort of loosens up and gets drunk and she starts singing Rock Around the Clock and her skirts fly up and the audience broke up and that was like, oh wow. And then if, you, if I showed you my high school yearbook, you'd laugh because there's all these notes from people saying, I didn't know you were funny. I wish I had known you sooner. I've never, you know, because the week before graduation. So that was sort of the beginning of it. And it kind of grew from there. Built on a lot of like envy and resentment, you know, also. That's part of it. Like, ugh. So that's Well, can I hard. ask a follow-up to that? Sure. Which is... Uh, it, Learning that you're funny is one piece, and but a lot of the comedy you do, as you talked about, is taking things that are sometimes challenging and hard and building ways to connect with people across difference. Was that like a second piece of learning about what you could do with comedy? Hmm. I think it was, uh, you know, what's the fr necessity breeds invention. Um, I, I was getting, I always, uh, see, when I was at Second City, Second City, which took place in, which it's founded in Chicago. Chicago, give it up for Chicago, I love Chicago. But for years and years and years, Second City had like 99.9% .9 white actors. And, and I was in a touring company, but th was hoping I could get in the main stage company. And the, you know, it, acting, creative things are so subjective. So nobody can actually say, you know, something like, we don't want you because you're black or something. They find, there are other ways to say things. And I just always ended up being on the outside looking in. And uh, to the point where at one point, the first black mayor of Chicago was elected, Harold Washington, and they had a white actor playing him. Luckily, not in blackface, but they just had him playing and was like, what? You know, uh, anyway, um, some of that frustration, I think, helped fuel me to find, it got me on stage. I wasn't getting stage time there. I started doing my own comedy, and my own comedy really came from a lot of frustrating things like you don't sound black or blah, blah you know, other things, you're so tall, just things that were real. And that's, I mean, in the end, I, I'm grateful for all of it because it's like It's a Wonderful Life. Had anything gone differently, uh, everything would be different. 
Like at Oberlin, I was not in the theater crowd. I finally got like one part um, senior year in a student production, but I was always carrying around all of this. I can do more and I'm gonna show them and So that's not really funny, but <laughs> anyway, I think I'm getting a little. Thank you, well, we have a question. Sorry, this person is waiting very Hi. patiently. <laughs> Thank you. Howard Luloff from St. Louis Park. First, I'll start off with a comment. Oh, no. But I'm a, a big brief fan comment. of Sunday morning and enjoy the diversity of stories from the opening trumpet fanfare mm. to what I think is the best use of the visual aspect of television, the closing nature scene. My question to Nancy is, of all the stories or interviews you've done on Sunday morning, if you could pick one out that's your favorite, what would it be? Oh my hmm. goodness, my favorite. Well, I already mentioned Mitch Album because that one really um, blew my mind, but oh gosh. Um, oh, I guess I can tell you too. You're not leaving, are you? Oh, he's sitting in the back, okay. <laughs> where, where are you going? I'm, I'm answering you. Where are you going? You don't have to come back, you can just sit down. I thought you were leaving after, okay. I can tell you too. No, okay, that's fine. Um, is there something where you wanted to say? I just thought you were leaving. That's why I, yes, okay. You don't have to, okay. The, I can tell you personally two dear, dear stories to me. One was about my father and one was about my mom. My mom loved Sunday morning. She grew up with Billy Taylor, who used to be on in the, old, in, in the older days of the show, jazz musician. And she, it's, it's because of her that I ever watched the show, but she didn't live to see me on it. So I finally was able to like write a little tribute to her that they aired on Mother's Day one year. And I did a piece about my father. And when I was growing up, we called, my parents were mom and Giles. I never called my father dad or father, he was Giles. So I wrote this piece called Giles Day all about him. He was still alive. He used to call me after every, every time I appeared on the show and say something sweet. And, I, and he called me after that piece aired and I could hear a catch in his voice. He was like really emotional. He was like, Th thanks kiddo. And you know, so I'd have to say those, those two really meant a lot to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was leaving. That was great. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Sue, and I'm from Minneapolis, and that was my question. Oh, uh, my God. But I still am standing here, so we're going to come in with a pinch hitter. Um, <laughs> Way to go, Sue. Uh, I, first of all, I've enjoyed all the years that I've watched you oh, on thanks. CBS Sunday morning. It's thanks. It's completely enjoyable. I love your sense of humor. I love how you tell stories. It just is a good way to begin a day. Kind of piggybacking on his question, you know, of which stories kind of moved you, I'm wondering, was there a story in particular that you presented on CBS Sunday morning that kind of maybe move the needle a little bit more than you thought it might? That's a really good question. Uh, I'll cop to this because I think it moved the needle in a good way. Um, in May of 2020, when George Floyd unfortunately was murdered, uh, there, were, there were three different events that sort of converged. And actually, George Floyd was murdered the same day that, he, that that happened to him. In Central Park, a gentleman named Christian Cooper was just asking a woman to put her dog on a leash where they were supposed to be leashed. And she went off and said, I'm going to tell the police that an African-American man is threatening my life. So there was that. And then there was a, a jogger named Ahmad Arbery who just jogging and maybe put, you know looking in the window of an abandoned house, you know, those three events on video were just, and we were in the middle of COVID. It was a, it was a crazy time. And um, a colleague at Sunday Morning wrote an essay, and it, it was, I don't know that it was necessarily a defense of people being called Karens. And by the way, where is Karen? Karen, you're not a Karen. You are Karen, okay? Give it up, right? And a volunteer. She took care of me today. Anyway, um, she wrote a piece that got a lot of people kind of up in arms about, you know, and she represented, she talked about her, her feelings about Karen's and valid opinions all, but there was quite a lot of, um, you know, uh, emotion about it. And um, I got a call from my boss not saying, 
do you want to answer back, but asking me to like take a look at the essay and tell me what he thought. And I read it and I thought, well, you know, I've, got, I've definitely got a different point of view. So I wrote my piece and I was really proud of it because I don't feel like I necessarily criticized her. I just wanted to educate people on where the leg of where Karen's and the legacy of like unfair accusations came from, especially from white women against black men. And I think the thing I was most grateful for about that piece, and it's terrible, is that all three of those horrible events were on videotape. And it real I felt like I was getting mail from my f dear friends, white friends, saying, I didn't realize. I really didn't know. Or even things like, I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know I don't know what to say. I mean, it brings tears to my eyes to think about it and how fortunate that people could see it because one of the things, it happened to me at Second City, it happened in other jobs. You know, when you would try to voice an opinion about, hey, you know, this should be more diverse, or did you think this or that or the other, you'd get pushback and comments like, you're so sensitive, or why does everything have to be about race when something racist or bigoted was done against you? So I, and that's another situation where something God awful, times three, and there are many, many more, and there's lots more on tape, happened to happen at a time that it felt like it, a whole movement coalesced and a lot of people's minds were opened. And, you know, th there's been comparison between January 6th and Black Lives Matter, um, you know, rallies. It's just, it's not even, in my humble opinion, I always have to say that in my humble opinion, in my humble opinion, there's, there's no comparison. Um, it was beautiful to see young people and old people and people of all colors and all, uh, from every kind of background, all realizing that. And the other thing that really came out of that was, I know that there were people that were f offended by the phrase Black Lives Matter and there was a lot of like White Lives Matter and why Black Lives and whatnot. I have a friend who is uh, white and lives in Long Island, and he had the best response because he has real conservative friends, and they're like, Black Lives Matter, what is that? What does that mean? And my friend Mike Braun said to some friends, okay, you know how they have those campaigns like Save the Whales? He said, they're not saying screw all the other fish. They're saying the whales, you know, they need, to, it's like that. And get this, his friends are like, okay, man, I get it. I'm fine with that, I'm fine with that, you know? So every little bit, every little bit helps. So that was, that was a real mind-numbing time and a lot of um, DEI programs, which unfortunately since um, affirmative action was, was canceled, a lot of these DEI programs are getting axed, which is just painful. But conversations were kind of started and I, I have to believe that they'll keep happening and, and we'll keep learning. Thank you for that question. I would have forgotten yeah. about that. So there's a, there's a related question here. Can you talk about a time when you were able to bridge an otherness gap with uh, a person? Oh, man. When I was able to bridge an otherness. Well, I'd, I'd like to think that that commentary, you know, might have, I, I'd go back to that. It did, even with people that I thought um, knew a lot of stuff, it felt like it underscored uh, some things. So, bye, you're going, okay, bye. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's okay. I understand traffic. St. Paul closes at eight, so. Oh. <laughs> Good one. Oh my God. So this will be my first and last <laughs> forum. Uh. <laughs> no, I will say this. I did, another, I did another commentary years ago about hair and the power of hair and, um, and just like the historical aspects of black hair and how everybody has these hair issues. And a lot, I got a lot of good feedback from that. People that were like, because one of the, Liz, you know this, one of the times it happened at Oberlin. This is back in the late 70s, early 80s. I was meeting white kids. I grew up in Queens, New York, the most diverse county in the country. And I was meeting kids, uh, smart kids, uh, well-to-do kids, regular kids, 
even New York City kids who never really knew anybody black, and they would actually, you know, touch the hair and go, oh my God, it's so soft. I mean, that kind of crap. No, it was real, and it was like, by, by sophomore year, I was like, stop touching my hair, you know, get away from me. Um, but that was a piece, I think, that helped people sort of see differences and things in common, that we all have these issues, whether we have hair or we don't, or goes gray or whatever. So I, I like to think of that piece, yeah. Okay. Do you have rules for yourself in when you're creating comedy, when you're writing something, of how you approach it, where you will go, what you won't do? Not, not really. I mean, because... Yeah, I mean, I, you know, no, not really. I've done, I, I've, <laughs> I, I think one thing that's helped is I, I'm listening more so I can find little, like, mini funny things all around. For instance, uh, I used to park my car at a place where you have to, like, leave your keys with the parking attendant. And one day I parked the car and I walked off and got a half a block away and realized I had my car keys. And I ran back and I gave them to the guy and I said, hey, what happens when people walk off with their keys? And he goes, I kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, I scribbled that down, you know, it's great. And uh, <laughs> there's another time post 9-11 where I was bopping along, I think on a city bike or something and stopped by a big garbage truck and a guy leans out and he said, hey, I like your red raincoat. And I said, hey, thanks. And he said, when you see something, say something. <laughs> I love that, right? So I think, I, so they're not really rules. I mean, I, I you know, my, I, I keep my, try to keep my ear open and if something inspires me, my God, then I can, I, run, I wrote a character in a solo show of mine based on two girls I heard talking on the subway uh, the crowded subway in New York, uh, they must have been junior high school girls, and if you've never been to New York, there's a specific thing that happens when school lets out and kids are on the subway or bus. The noise volume just goes through the roof, and these girls are like screaming back and forth. One word I can't say, but one girl said to the other girl, okay, it rhymes with witch, okay? She said, B, you must be eating Wheaties because you be talking like a champion. And I was like, breakfast of champions, that's Wheaties. This is amazing. I mean, you know, so, it, so sometimes it's just keeping your ear open to things. So I, I try not to limit myself because I always feel like I don't have enough, there's not enough going on and not, not enough good ideas. But something like that will sometimes spark something. So I've got two questions left. Okay. And this, this one builds off this last one. You started at Second City. You were trained as an improviser. What did improv train you to uh, hear, to listen to, to think about that has helped you through your career? Improv made me feel like I was a writer. Pri although I wrote, prior to improv, I had this vision in my mind of what a real writer looks like, and it goes something like this. Jane Fonda playing Lillian Hellman in the movie Julia. So, you had to chain smoke, you had to sit at an old-fashioned typewriter, mull, look out of the window, walk on the beach, you know, with like a uh, call up Dashiell Hammett, played by Jason Robarts, and say, Dash, I got the most wonderful idea for a play. It's called The Little Foxes. Like, I thought that's what, that, it had to do that. Improv made, it made it, I realized I was writing on my feet. You would get suggestions from the audience or little ideas that might have been sifting around in your mind, suddenly you grabbed onto them and you were able to like use them like weird things like, I always thought that Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben were married in some sort of <laughs> food processing dual world or something, you know? That you can, and you could use stuff like that, like it could be a scene or something. And, and for me still, the way I come up with a lot of the best material is kind of talking through stuff, tape recording it, then going back, and then transcribing it and sort of messing with it a little bit and, and doing it that way. So not only did that give me the confidence to feel like the ideas had merit, but I, it's, it's just, if, I think everybody, everybody in this room, everybody in the country could benefit from an improv class just to get you up and connecting with other people. And it's not about jokes. It's about being able to go with the flow and, you know, sort of bob and weave and be able to take something and make it into something and, and not be so rigid. And, and it's, it's just such, 
you know, it's just a, a wonderful art that just opens so many doors and gives you confidence and gets you listening to other people. Because if you're not listening, you're not improvising. Well, that is the perfect segue into the last thing I was going to ask, which is if you were to just leave folks here in the audience or listening later on the radio a piece of advice, if they want to think about how they tell stories, how they connect with people, how they embrace some of the Nancy Giles uh, philosophy of life, what would you suggest would be a good place to start? The Nancy Giles philosophy. Um, I... Okay, I think it would be listening, listen, listen. There's so much you can hear and learn. So it's not always putting out, it's these things, if it's taking the time and slowing things down and taking things in. Um, th that's just, that's really helped me. And there are gifts out there. And you see it a lot sometimes if you watch any of the news shows or interview shows where if you listen, if the person that's interviewing the person is listening, the conversation can go in all kinds of directions. But sometimes if there's a set set of questions, someone will answer the question that someone has and they'll ask the question because mm -hmm. they're not listening. And, or a conversation's going in a really interesting way and then it gets stopped by, you know, some, something dopey, in my humble opinion. Um, but I, I, have, I have found that to be a huge gift, not only in improv, but just in life, and I'm, I, I don't always do it, but I'm working toward that goal of listening. Less talking, not to you guys, but listening. Yeah, it's been a real gift. On that note, can you all do a big round of applause? Thank you Nancy for your, Giles. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your, oh my God. Thank you all so oh, wait, much wait, for wait, being I here. Picture. Wait, I have to take a picture. Thank you for coming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. A reminder, we've got breads and spreads and continuing the conversation outside. Thank you all so much for being here, and I hope to see you again at the next Westminster Town Hall Forum.